Um, this interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. The veteran's name is James Frederick Leithrum. He was born December 24, 1937. He served in the Cold War between February 1963 and February 1965. <clears throat> he achieved the rank of First Lieutenant. We are recording this on February 20th, 2016. I am Tatum Koval, and I am conducting this interview. There is no relation. All right. So, Mr. Leithram, uh, what? Where did you grow up? Dover, Delaware. Delaware. Okay. Did you live in the city, or did you live um, on a farm, or? Well, today you would call it a suburb. It was actually just outside the city when I grew up, mm -hmm. but it's now in the city. Okay. Great. Did you have any siblings? Yes, I have two brothers. Two brothers? Are they older or younger? One older, one younger. Okay. Did they serve, did they also serve in the military? My older brother served uh, in the uh, mid-1950s, just after the Korean War. Okay. Wow. Are they living um, near you right now, or? <coughs> one is in Maryland and one is in Oregon. Okay. Wow. So, yeah. very spread out. <laughs> Okay, so what was it like growing up where you did? Uh, did, did what was your middle school like? Well, Dover in those days, just before the development of Dover Air Force Base, which is a large military establishment now, mm -hmm. but before the air base came, the town was a population of maybe 5,000, so it was a small town. Uh, it wasn't unusual that uh, the only football game in town was between the south side and the north side of disorganized young men playing football. Yeah. It was that kind of small community. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, understand that uh, Dover is the capital of the state. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was embedded in uh, state history and uh, mm -hmm. to a certain extent state politics growing up in a, a town like that. In fact, I often tell the story that uh, in high school, we would maybe attend the movies once a week. If we didn't like the movie, we'd go to the state legislature for entertainment. Really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, it, was just, it was just down the street. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Wow. So what, uh, what were your parents like? What was it like? Um, what was a typical day in your household, I guess, growing up? Well, <clears throat> my father... Uh, worked as a farm machine mechanic for his entire career okay. for the, uh, the same farm machine mm -hmm. dealer. Um, and, uh, and I suppose you know, the <coughs> middle school years were pretty typical of any mm -hmm. fairly rural area. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up riding bicycles from, uh, I'd ride a bicycle to the lake, jump in to have a swim, jump on the bicycle, go to another lake, jump in. <laughs> It was, it was getting around that way. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, my brothers and I, uh, because of our father's experience, were required when we had our first car to tear it down and put it back together again before we got our license. Really? So that was a, a right of passage to manhood. Definitely. What was, what was the car that you guys bought? Well, my first car was a 1950 Dash. Mm -hmm. Well, the first car that we overhauled was a 36 Ford, uh, but uh, all of us had to do that. And when my <laughs> oldest son came to age, he didn't have a summer job one year, so mm -hmm. I sent him to Dover to spend the part of the summer with my father, and they took a car apart, so he had even, <laughs> even done it with a, one of his grandsons. Family tradition. <laughs> wow. Did you play any sports in high school? Not organized. Okay. Uh, while I was in high school, I worked for a clothing store mm -hmm. in, in the center of the town. So I was busy every Friday night. Mm -hmm. and, uh, very busy over holidays, and holiday weekends. Mm -hmm. But I would not give up that experience for anything. And, mm -hmm. you know, what they taught me about working with the public was invaluable. Really? Yeah. Really? Would you work there during the week frequently? Every afternoon, 3.30 to 5.30. Wow, okay. <coughs> so a lot of time there. 
Wow. So, were, did your parents make you get a job or did you choose to get the job? I got it myself. Yeah, definitely. Um, you said you, that you were interested in the history. What was, was that your favorite subject in high school? Well, <coughs> understand I'm an engineer, so I'm inherently interested in math and mm -hmm. science. But uh, yes, my favorite pastime now at the age of 78 is reading history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even though I'm blind, I read a yeah. lot of history. But that's thanks to the Library of Congress where I get my digital books and read through my uh, ears. Definitely. That makes sense. <coughs> <laughs> so did you go to college? Yes. Okay, where did you go to college? Uh, undergraduate at the University of Delaware mm -hmm. and graduate school at Princeton. Wow, okay. What was there, did you prefer one over the other? Of the university? Mm -hmm. Oh, they were fundamentally different. Really? How so? Uh, Delaware is a state supporting university. Mm -hmm. uh, Land grade college, so it's very much like Clemson. Mm -hmm. uh, Princeton is an Ivy League private university. And the graduate program at Princeton was clearly more unit toward turning you into a teacher for other universities. Okay. Which when I finished at Princeton, I could not deny the fact that someday I would be teaching at a university. That's what I was trained for. Definitely. So once you graduated from graduate school, yes. did you go straight on to become a teacher or did no. you get a different job? I had delayed my military service while I was in graduate school from 59 to 63. Mm -hmm. And then went on active duty in 63 to 65. Okay. And went in industry for two years. And then started back at the University of Delaware in 67. So okay. it was 12 years from the undergraduate degree until I started teaching. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. About 12 years. Eight years. Eight years. Yeah. <laughs> Rhythmic together. Yeah. <laughs> um, so during that time, okay, well, I guess let me ask do you, you're married? Correct. Um, wh when did you meet your wife? At the University of Delaware. Okay. She was a nursing student there. Okay. And how long have you guys been married? Uh, Fifty-five and a half years. Wow. Wow. That's so great. Um, okay. So when you decided to go on active duty, um, what, what were your first thoughts? Were you nervous or were you kind of okay with it because it was a peacetime? Well, of course. I was commissioned in 1959, so mm -hmm. there was four years there I was in graduate school when I had to deal with the realities. Uh, 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 I knew as soon as I finished my graduate work that I was going to be called back to duty. Mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing about it is that they gave me credit for those years in graduate school, and I became a first lieutenant when I entered active duty, so uh, mm -hmm. I did not have to wait for my first promotion. I was, already a first lieutenant when I went on active duty. Wow, okay. Were you on active duty in Delaware, or where did you...? No, I joined the Army to see the world, and they sent me to northern New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I spent all my active duty time at uh, Picatinny Arsenal in northern New Jersey. Really? Okay. <laughs> so what was that move like? <laughs> it's hard to believe, but you generally think of New Jersey as being a very densely populated state. Mm -hmm. But this army base, uh, Picatinny Arsenal, if you take Manhattan Island and move it 35 miles west and sit mm -hmm. it down in New Jersey, then you have Picatinny Arsenal. But it has been a government installation since George Washington's day. Mm. So it remains wild. It, it is a primitive and wild area wow. in the midst of a densely populated uh, state. Definitely. So it, it was a beautiful time. Mm -hmm. it was a really wonderful experience. When, um, so in Delaware, did a lot of your extended family live in the same area? Uh, well, my wife's family all lived in northern Delaware. Okay. My family was in Dover, which was mid state. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm called a down homeowner. My wife is a, a city slicker. <laughs> Oh. And you were telling me an interesting story about how your last name came to be. Do you want to share that? Well, uh, I'm only the uh, second generation of the use of the name Lethrum. Uh, during the Great Migration at the end of the 19th century, 
when people were immigrating into this country, it wasn't unusual for immigration officers to find the names to be difficult to pronounce and suggest a more phonetic spelling. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to uh, my grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I have uncles with different spellings of the name. Mm -hmm. and, uh, From my father on down, it's been Lutheran, and so I have one nephew in Oregon that I've never met, but I think every other Lutheran I know. <laughs> wow, that's so... Sorry, I haven't met him because he, he's only a couple years old, I just haven't yeah. seen him. <laughs> <laughs> that's so fascinating. Wow. Okay, so let's go back. So you were on active duty. Um, what was your job description? Yeah. Well, uh, let me take an overall view of the question first. Mm -hmm. I was assigned to the Feltman Research Laboratories doing research on nuclear weapons effects. Um, the Army during that period of peacetime was trying to get all the scientists and engineers with advanced degrees into these laboratories to help with this research. So I got assigned to the lab largely because of my own graduate work, mm -hmm. which in similar work. Mm -hmm. Not nuclear weapons, but similar technology. Uh, but I got to Picatinny, and the first thing they said for me to do is to find some more people like myself. So my first job was to go to the other places where young officers were being brought into active duty, mm -hmm find those with advanced degrees in science or engineering. So a headhunter almost. <laughs> a head but that turned out to be an invaluable experience because I have been a recruiter ever since, one sort of the other. Really? Uh, but there were a couple of folks that literally had their feet on the ramp for the airplane going to Vietnam. Uh -huh. Well, I would grab them and say, no, you're going with me. No way. And I would get their order changed and, and and they've been lasting friends for 50 years. <laughs> well, I bet that's a good way to start a uh, friendship. <laughs> but they were all uh, young lieutenants. Most mm -hmm. of them were first lieutenants like myself. Mm -hmm. So we formed a cadre of probably eight, or eight to ten young officers there at Picatinny. Uh -huh. And if you've ever watched the movie or the TV show MASH, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Soldiers in Bash had very little use for army regulation. Mm -hmm. Well, that was, that was <laughs> the folks that I dealt with. Young folks who were determined to do good work. They were mm -hmm. very highly motivated uh, scientists and engineers mm -hmm. and were determined to do very good work that had no use for army regulations whatsoever. Oh, really? Uh, Would you ever get into trouble because of that? Well, it was close. Yeah. <laughs> No, there was real respect, I believe, mm -hmm. between the traditional army and the, the these eight mm -hmm. young officers. A lot of respect between them, uh, but uh, when it came to useless regulations, there mm -hmm. was, there was no, uh, no quarter given. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, let me continue that story a little bit by mm -hmm. jumping ahead 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you will notice in that period that I was on active duty included the November 1963 period mm -hmm. when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. Oh. So I was on active duty then. Mm -hmm. And the 50th anniversary of that assassination was 2003. Mm -hmm. So I got to thinking in 2003, I wonder if I could find those eight folks mm -hmm. that I work with. Yeah. Uh, I knew they had scattered. Mm -hmm. uh, I found all but two, uh -huh. and they were obituaries. Mm -hmm. Two of my colleagues have already died. So uh, have you been in contact with the others? Yes. yes. Really? Yes. Have, you, have you guys been able to see each other? No, but we exchanged mm -hmm. uh, memories yeah. over the telephone. And Are they still them. living in the, living? Up north or all over? Uh, all over. Really? Wow. How fascinating. So what was 
What was the your personal experience with the assassination? How did you react? What were your initial thoughts? Well, the th thing that I remember, and it's mm -hmm. a strange thing, I'll tell you what I remember. Mm -hmm. That was on a Friday afternoon. Okay. And uh, the rules around the laboratory were, the Friday afternoons were casual. Mm -hmm. So I, I had taken my uniform, I, I lived just off the post, and I had taken my uniform, I, I was wearing the uniform in the morning, mm -hmm. I went home for lunch. I took my uniform off, put on civilian clothes, and took my uniform to the uh, laundry to be clean, to ready to start wearing for the mm -hmm. next Monday. Mm -hmm. I went back to the office about 1 p.m., and the word came down that the president had been shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to thinking there would be some kind of a memorial. Mm -hmm where we in uniform would have to stand before the flag and, uh, and recognize that, that, that this is a, a major event. Mm -hmm. My uniforms were in the laundry at that point. <laughs> 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 so I, I had to rush back off, get down to the laundry, <laughs> plead with the guy to get these uniforms done. And lo and behold, there was a, uh, wow. a, a gathering of the troops at uh -huh. the flagpole. Uh, mm -hmm. Saturday morning, wow. <laughs> and I had to be in uniform Saturday morning. <laughs> wow. wow. Uh, so it's those small things that you remember from these major events. Definitely. But down to the point that I can remember getting the word around 1 p.m. That's, uh, wow, definitely, yeah. definitely. So going back to you and your group of worker buddies, <laughs> um, what was the average day like? Again, what was that, what did that, Entitled. Well, uh, all the interactions were generally individual to individual, office to office types things. Mm -hmm. We we seldom had big seminars or meetings or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. But I worked very closely with a fellow from um, University of California, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. and he was a nuclear engineer, and uh, he had been using big computers for a lot longer than I had. Mm -hmm. Big computers hadn't been along, around very long. Mm -hmm. even then. So he got me involved in working with computers to uh, do the work that we're doing. I'm not going to say any more about that. Mm -hmm. The work that we were doing. Uh, and uh, he st I did contact him 50 years later. He's still living. He's still doing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm just eternally grateful for him because of what he told me. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days, nuclear engineers relied very heavily upon computers. From the very days of the Manhattan Project mm -hmm. and during the Second World War, all the nuclear uh, reactors and weapons work were, were done using big computers. Mm -hmm. And no other industry or no other discipline had really gone that far. Mm -hmm. So he was ahead of me at that point in computing. But by the time I left the Army, uh, I was one of those guys then. I was heavily involved. And that determined my career from there on. I've been in computing ever since. Mm -hmm. So it was a career-defining experience. Definitely. Wow. So, because you went on to go teach computer yes, science, yeah, correct? Yes. OK, and where did you teach? Computer science. I taught computer science at the University of Delaware for 13 years, okay. then came here and taught computer engineering here for 20 years. Okay, at Clemson? Yes. Wow, okay. So did the idea during that time of nuclear warfare, did it intimidate you? Were you constantly thinking about it, or did you not think twice about it um, in your day-to-day -day actions? Oh, it was a day-to-day -day concern. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Uh, I understand I never did anything more dangerous than maybe trip over a desk drawer. <laughs> uh, but I do take some gratification that I did some things that helped the leaders on both sides of the ocean mm -hmm. to avoid miscalculations. Mm -hmm. And in the Cold War, miscalculations were the, the greatest danger. Mm -hmm. If uh, the Russian leaders calculated that we were weak, that would lead to certain actions on their part, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Definitely. Wow. So that was the motivating concern. Mm-hmm. Wow. I, I, I will say something interesting about the recruiting that I was doing. It wasn't until recently, I would say in the last couple of years, I was reading the history of the Manhattan Project uh, mm-hmm. during the Second World War and read that uh, they had the authority during the Second World War to identify soldiers that were being drafted that had advanced degrees in science and engineering and move them to the Manhattan Project. Really? And I looked into it and that was exactly the authority that I was using. And I didn't realize it at the time. Wow. It was left over from the Manhattan Project. Uh-huh. Wow. Uh, that's so interesting. I didn't mm-hmm. Wow. So you, you served for a total of six years? Well, I was on active duty for two. Okay. The reserve period was while I was in graduate school for uh, okay. three years, or three or four years. Mm-hmm. And then a few months after active duty, I was still in the reserves. Okay. So six total, including active duty for two. Mm-hmm. So while you were um, working at that time, what was your wife doing? When I was in graduate school, she was uh, practicing and teaching nursing in Princeton. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we went back to Delaware, she continued to work at, the, at one of the hospitals in Wilmington, Delaware. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she has not practiced nursing since we've been here in South Carolina. Okay. Did you guys have any kids? Too? We have three children. Yes. Okay. And how old are they? The oldest one uh, is 53. Mm-hmm. Next one is 47. Next one is 43. Okay. And did any of them serve in the military? No. No. All right. Um, do you, what are they doing now? The oldest one is a professor okay. at Old Dominion University in uh, Virginia. The second one is a professor at uh, Jacksonville State University in Alabama mm-hmm. in mathematics. And the youngest one still lives with us. He's a young man with Down syndrome and has multiple disabilities. Mm-hmm. And in fact, my wife did not go back to practice nursing because she had to commit a lot of time to him mm-hmm. in his early years, in the 1970s. So, Definitely. Um, she has been a dedicated caregiver now for yeah. 43 years. So. Wow. Yeah, Definitely. So a lot of professors in your family then. Yes. <laughs> Three out of five, right? <laughs> I didn't influence their... Uh, you didn't? <laughs> And like your dad in the cars. <laughs> but it is gratifying. And, mm-hmm. uh, I was the first of my family to go to college. And, oh. uh, so to see my children go ahead and go through graduate school and uh, become academics is Definitely. very gratifying. Are they in the Clemson area? One is in Virginia, one is in Alabama. Okay, that makes sense. So what, uh, what eventually brought you to come to Clemson, South Carolina, from Delaware? Well, strangely enough, uh, I was still on the faculty at the University of Delaware, mm-hmm. and I was on a recruiting trip. I was traveling around to several universities trying to hire faculty. So you've been a headhunter so for... <laughs> I stopped in Clemson uh-huh. and... Uh, got to talking, and one thing led to another, and they said, well, would you like to come to Clemson? <laughs> so instead of me bringing faculty back, I ended up coming to Clemson. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> That's so, so if you were to say one, I mean, in your experience of recruiting people, what do you think is one of the most important things, um, trying, you know, to reel people in and hire them? That's hard to say. Uh, well, you really do have to be sympathetic to the scholarly approach to life. Mm-hmm. If a person is interested in scholarship and inventing and developing new ideas, the surrounding and the job situation has to be supportive of that Mm-hmm. Uh, activity. Mm-hmm. And if you can't do that, uh, you're not doing your recruiting job, you should be doing it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, included, 
what I was doing in the Army because you know, understand that people that were avoiding Vietnam were only too happy to go with me, but a lot of people would say, well, where's Picketing? I don't even know where it is. <laughs> and I would have to convince them that they could do some good work there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. And I bet that's tough sometimes. Yeah. Definitely. Wow. So what, what's the difference, what would you say the main difference is between uh, Delaware and South Carolina? Spending time in both. Well, that's that's a really tough one. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it could uh, end up being a controversial answer. <laughs> uh, well, we we happen to be in the middle of a political season here in South Carolina right now, and this would never happen in Delaware. What, really? What we're seeing in South Carolina. How so? No. <clears throat> Understand the entire state of Delaware is about 500,000 people. Okay. And yet it has all the political structure of any other state. Mm -hmm. So it would not be unusual to find yourself in the presence of the governor at least once a year. Mm -hmm. uh, you knew the politicians. Mm -hmm. Sometimes on a first name basis. <laughs> really? Uh, wow. So, uh, politicians would not degrade each other mm -hmm. the way you see it happening here in South Carolina now. Mm -hmm. uh, that just wouldn't happen. Definitely. Uh, uh, do you think that's a, um, a time change or do you think it's a state it, it change? It may be. Now, understand, I've been away from Delaware for 35 years and mm -hmm. it may have been such that I. I wouldn't say favorable things about it either. Mm -hmm. um, but I think right now South Carolina has a great deal going for it. Mm -hmm. um, Delaware has undergone a lot of population growth. The population is much more dense there than it was 35 years ago when I left. Mm -hmm. um, And they've gone through some real tough economic problems. The, the last uh, uh, financial crisis that occurred in 2008 hit Delaware really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and I may not be up on all of the things that uh, have happened there since 2008. This is my wife, Barbara. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Tatum. I'm Barbara. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm going over and see about voting. Okay. I may be right back because I have a feeling that after POA breakfast, they'll all end up over there to vote. So I may be right back until later. Okay, we can get through the door. Last night, this door wasn't working. Hmm. So I'll go down to the other one if it's not. But you want to focus on the military, veteran experience. Yeah, well, uh, completely your <laughs> your life. <laughs> Just everything about your life is what we want to know. But um, do you have any other uh, stories that stick with you from your military experience? Well, I, I've already referred to the uh, eight or ten close associates when I was uh, mm -hmm. in the Army. But the entire military uh, post and establishment there at Picatinny was unusual as military places go. Uh, there was a usual respect for rank, but uh, after duty hours and things of that sort, rank distinctions broke down very, very quickly. Mm. Uh, we had a rod and gun club, mm -hmm. uh, fishing and hunting and things of that sort. And the lowest level of enlisted people were generally in leadership roles in their own gun club. Really? <laughs> and we would have a, a figurehead leader, or maybe a major or something of that sort, being the, the official president. Mm -hmm. But the guys that really ran the show <laughs> were the privates and the sergeants. Wow. Um, wow. That's so fun. What a cool experience to do that. I don't know. Um, the Navy had some personnel there too, and they were the same way, but uh, it, it's just that the, the, the uh, physical location was 
displaced from any other military establishment around, so they, they could sort of form their own rules. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But one story I, I like to tell, I mentioned a rod and gun club. Um, the commanding officer at Picatinny was a colonel, mm -hmm. and there was a golf course that had uh, lakes and golf course and water holes and things mm -hmm. like that. So the colonel imported some wild ducks from uh, Maryland to put on his lake there so that he could have his wild ducks. Uh -huh. They had the wings clipped so the ducks couldn't fly very far. Yeah. So one day, uh, in fact, one of the guys that I recruited for Piccadilly and I were out on the road not too far from the golf course hunting pheasants. Mm -hmm. We each had 12 gauge shotguns that uh, we had chipped out of the uh, I guess out of the uh, officer's club. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were walking along the road and a bird jumped up in front of me and I raised my gun up and had the bird in my sights and it was one of the colonel's ducks. <gasps> <laughs> and I did not pull the trigger. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, I got to thinking that it was something like uh, when uh, Mr. Roberts threw the uh, palm tree overboard in, in the Mr. Roberts, you ever seen the Mr. Roberts movie? I didn't know. <laughs> If I had shot that duck, I would still be in the brig, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh, gosh. Oh, you were I, lucky on that I one. I your heart stop. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is so funny. Wow. Wow. What a great time. So, where the base was located, was it in a wooded area? Very heavily wooded. Very mountainous. Okay. Uh, the, uh, we had a deer hunt every year, mm -hmm. and what would happen, we'd get a line of, uh, these were all GIs, mm -hmm. driving the deer one way, and another line here, when the deer came out of the woods, shooting at the deer, coming this way. Oh, so really? It's called a deer drive. Oh, wow. And this was in an area of the post called the nitroglycerin area. Mm -hmm. uh, it, during the 1920s, there had been a major explosion. They, they actually produced munitions there at Piccadilly. Mm -hmm. And this nitroglycerin area had been off limits uh, ever since because of explosive materials still lying around on the ground. Right. Uh, but they let us have a deer hunting there because the deer population was too high, so they wanted to get rid of something. And uh, the guys that were driving the deer said they, they, they'd never been shot at so many times. <laughs> That's so, yeah, that, I mean, that sounds a little dangerous. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I remember one major said, it, uh, he said, I was in Korea, but I said, I got down behind a tree on this one. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. So did a lot of people that you had served with um, serve during World War II um, or had, had been in the... A lot of them had been in Korea and okay. ended up in Vietnam, too. Okay. Um, this one major turner, I, I often wonder, he was a very skilled um, uh, well, cavalry, he served in a cavalry unit. Mm -hmm. I often wonder if he made it through Vietnam. Uh, I, I'm not taking the time to look for his name on the, the wall. But uh, uh, interesting people. Mm -hmm. When you were saying that you're interested in looking for people who served at the same yes. time you did, um, what do you think is the best way to get in contact with them? Google. Google? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you said your serial yeah. number helps a lot too, yes. right? Would you like to share your serial number? Well, I gave you. Yes, anyone's welcome to that serial number. That's public knowledge. Okay, perfect. Do you want to yeah. say it um, on the interview too? Okay, the serial number is 05. Two zero nine two five four. Perfect. Perfect. That's great. You, you were starting to say something I was going to say about uh, the other people. Looking for people who served with you? Yes. Oh, the Google experience. Uh, there's one fellow, uh, in fact, he was. One of the obituaries, I think, uh, who when he died, uh, his congressman from Oklahoma entered uh, a memorial statement in the record, the, the congressional record, mm -hmm. 
commemorating his service. He had subsequently gone to work for the Defense Department and had served for some time after that. And uh, this item in the congressional record mentioned service in Piccadilly. So Google found the uh, congressional record item for me with his name in it. And it in turn referred me to Piccadilly, so I knew I had the right guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out to be a very useful way of tracking people down. Yeah, amazing how... But I understand all these people had PhDs, so all of them did a lot of publishing, including mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. So it was not unusual to find something that they had published mm -hmm. in the last 50 years and Definitely. track them down. Wow, wow. Well, I, I guess my final question is, do you have any um, lasting words of advice or <laughs> words of intelligence that you want to share um, for the interview? Well, I guess when I s summarize my military experience, mm -hmm. uh, I come down very strongly in favor of a citizen army as opposed to a professional army. Now, I understand that uh, military service is much more technical nowadays than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, uh, I believe the citizen soldier has served this country exceedingly well mm -hmm. and tends to uh, not accept things quite as readily on the political side, mm -hmm. uh, be more skeptical. Mm -hmm. uh, of things. And uh, I think particularly now in 2016, we would be served very well if we had a citizen army. Really? Uh, now that generally means a draft, and that's a very controversial thing. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Uh, but I line myself with General Douglas MacArthur, who, one of our most famous generals in the Second World War, who mm -hmm. highly valued the citizen soldier as being the best, the best soldiers that uh, this country ever produced. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm convinced of that. Do you think it increases nationalism during the war? Or what, what do you think, by having a draft, for example, uh, also implements? Well, I've never been in a combat situation, so I can't mm -hmm. say from personal experience. You hear stories about the Brotherhood being form and, and unit cohesion being formed mm -hmm. in combat situations. Uh, I don't think the citizen soldier has suffered in that regard. Mm -hmm. I think they, they've been highly contributive uh, from the days of George Washington mm -hmm. till today. Um, uh, I, I know that the draft is controversial and uh, uh, a lot of people, for good reasons, try to avoid the draft and things of that sort. Uh, um, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the professional with military. Right. Really? I'll just leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I appreciate I appreciate you sharing that. Definitely. All right. Well, if you have if you don't have any um, thing else to add, then I just want to say thank you so much thank for you. your thank service you. and for your time taking this interview.